Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here, of course. It's an honor to speak for class six, maybe. Uh, and I'm officially in section 64 and also section 63, and I know that because I've been editing a, editing a lot of PNAS papers since last April, so I've gotten warmed up pretty well. Um, we were asked to talk at least for a moment about what brought us into our science, and I think this says it. Uh, it's cliche in a lot of ways, but it really was powerful for me uh, when I was very young. And um, since then, the effort in my world has been trying to kind of unravel this incredible earth that we live on and understand it at new scales that seemed impossible when I started in the science, and I think that's what I'll show you today. I want to start with this and, and ask you, what do you see when you look top down with state-of-the-art NASA technology? This is it. This is from the Terra satellite, from the MODIS sensor. And you see the Earth in, uh, in its uh, primary land covers, ice and ocean, uh, as well as green cover and brown deserts. That's a radically different view than if you look at Earth from the bottom up. This is the bottom up view based on traces of internet and cellular call technology. And it's just a radically different look at what's happening on Earth today. And that is one of our biggest uh, challenges or problems in ecology, I would argue. And that cascades to, to challenges and problems in what we call sustainability science. How we understand the ecology of our planet and, and, it's, and the other support systems like the geosphere, the cryosphere, and so forth, and how we understand that well enough to do things that promote sustainability into the future, a lot of that has to do with scale. And the issue of scale is one of trying to see the big picture in terms of something relevant on the Earth's surface over a large enough area, but also at a very fine detail. You can almost look at these two, slide, these two uh, images as kind of the state of the art uh, in ecology up until just recent years. You see the Google Earth view of deforestation uh, shown in the bottom left, and you see somebody climbing a tree to study the canopy on the right in the same forest as in that Google Earth view. So you see this radical difference in scale, and that has been a challenge to kind of break, to go into these forests or into ecosystems and unravel them at such a large scale, but with that kind of detail as shown there. Some of the effects or problems of not being able to do that well are listed here. Um, some of them include, of course, natural progression of ecological estimates that have biases that we try to overcome as scientists. A lot of those nowadays, the, the ecological sciences, <clears throat> are almost running in time with, with policy in a lot of ways. So sometimes what we don't know or what we make estimates on can lead to inappropriate actions or inaction. That's often the case. And then my pet peeve is we seem to have this problem of uninspired people at times in terms of the science not speaking clearly enough to the non-scientist. This is a self-promoting slide uh, to show that what we've done at Carnegie, and, and it represents my, my uh, greater community, is to try to break this kind of scale problem, try to solve it. For us, we have fancy aircraft, and we've built very unique instruments, for example, that can take this uh, view of a forest from above and actually convert it into the chemical and biological diversity of the forest for the first time. This is 2012 technology. Another one is using lasers. Uh, we don't use actual red and blue lasers. We use infrared lasers. But those allow us to image the Earth's surface in 3D with detail that you thought was not possible before. This is a, an, a 3D sectional view of a tropical rainforest. You see the palm tree and the, the emergent tree sticking out and so forth. All the way down to the leaf and, and ground level below. A true 3D understanding. It's so 3D nowadays, and this is 2014 technology, is that we're able to produce these environments and actually experience them, say, as other animals do. Say, as a, as a harpy eagle might on the top of this canopy. What I want to do now is talk about how we've taken these technologies and applied them. And this is we at Carnegie, but also my community as well. And there's this extremely fast growth in this area in terms of earth science. Using scientific visualization, 
which is a combination of quantitative observation and interpretation on computers to, under, to, to make an, an, an impact both in our own science and outside of our science. And this example comes from conservation and management. I've had the fortune of working in southern Africa for a while now. And like most places, uh, southern Africa has uh, this incredible constellation of protected areas, as you see in blue. And protected areas automatically mean that there's some sort of management that's taking place. They are either fenced or, or virtually fenced. And there are humans inside these protected areas with the mission of trying to sustain the, the biota, the environment, for, for the future. That's what a protected area is, is about. Uh, and of course, ecotourism is part of that. An example of how we use the 3D imaging technology is one that has to do with fire. Fire is extremely important in savanna ecosystems on the African continent. All over the world, fire is important uh, as a management tool. Well, depending on how you use fire, you can create savannas that turn from what you see in the foreground here, a very open savanna with lots of fire used, to a very closed savanna as we literally cross a fence line. And now you see the canopy in 3D and the woody vegetation in red. And what happens is the way you use that fire uh, tool allows managers to open and close the savanna in a way that can promote or not the existence of other species, species that, for example, use woody vegetation or that don't. I'm going to do an example here of lions. Lions are an interesting species because, one, they're charismatic and they promote lots of ecotourism, and two, a lot of their behaviors are still a little bit of a mystery in science. And so what we do with 3D imaging is we take, uh, in this case, male and female lions, and we put collars on them, and we track their movements in the 3D environment. Skipping many, many steps, you end up with a result like this, which speaks to the non-expert. On the left, male lions utilize preferentially the dense vegetation in a savanna, and female lions use, on the right, the open savanna vegetation. And so what happens is, you can imagine, if you want to promote the hunting behavior of males over females, you might use fire differently to open or close the savanna. And what's really important to savanna managers is making sure you build a landscape, for example, with fire as a tool, that allows for the intermixing of these types of environments. For example, to get female and male lions operating in the same area. Okay? So that's an example of how science in 3D has promoted conservation and management. Science visualization to support policy. One of the big policy initiatives in my generation as a scientist has been the issue of climate change. And the Amazon is central to that issue. It harbors a vast amount of the carbon, and it's part of our uh, Earth's regulatory system in terms of the, uh, the, the biosphere atmosphere and how it interacts. As many of you know, the Amazon is at kind of this uh, important moment uh, in, its, in its contemporary history, one where we're wondering if the future will be kind of this negative future in terms of deforestation and CO2 emissions and a destabilization of our climate system caused by poorly managed environments over large areas, for example, biofuels development, mining, and cattle ranching in ways that are not sustainable, per perhaps or this kind of utopian idea that the system should be a place where forests are, are left standing and carbon dioxide is decreased, the emissions of carbon dioxide are decreased, and the climate change strategy is in place for this kind of, of region. One of the big policy initiatives that has completely uh, driven a lot of our science for the last 11 years in particular is this thing called RED. It's, a, it's a, originally a United Nations and, uh, type of policy for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. That's the red. It's a powerful idea that came out really in about 2003, which says that we can use our forests to sequester carbon in a way that's cost effective and that will help mitigate the rate of climate change on a global scale. One of the big problems with that has been monitoring these forests and understanding where is the carbon. Is it going into the forest? Is it coming out? Are policy initiatives that are being made at the UN level or at the national level or even at smaller jurisdictional levels having a positive or negative effect on the carbon in these systems. So with the 3D imaging technology, has, it has come to the, uh, the forefront that these laser systems can map 
the forest in 3D. We can see very accurately where the carbon stocks are. Red is lots of carbon, blue is almost very little carbon here, and you see a highway that's been built through part of the southern Peruvian Amazon in this particular example. And this kind of work is really just now making it policy actionable that we can say this region has such and such a carbon stock and the policy initiatives can be made based on that knowledge. It's like knowing how much money you have in your bank before you buy a house or something. Um, in this case, the, the, the scientific challenge is scaling it and there are great efforts to scale these kinds of technologies up. None of them are in orbit today. They're all by aircraft, the ones that I've showed you today so far. But even with those aircraft measurements, using the newest in machine learning language, uh, big data com computation, we're able to map, for example, the entire country of Peru, 128 million hectares. That's nearly 300 million acres. And you're able to do it in an efficient way that allows a policy maker or a leader or a or a, a kid in school to cruise around inside the, the country of Peru and see, ah, we have lots of carbon in red in this region, a lot of deforestation in blue. We can cruise over to this area and see how the Andes, how the carbon is situated up into the montane system of the Andes and so forth. Next, scientific visualization to create action. This is new for me. And what's happened is, is during our scientific studies and explorations all over the planet, we've often encountered issues that we didn't uh, plan for, and we were there at either the right time or the wrong time, depending on how you think about it. One is the gold mining problem throughout the tropics. Gold prices skyrocketed, especially after 2008, but they were already on the rise. Gold mining has an incredibly unsustainable footprint in many regions of the planet. There's, here's a region, you see illegal gold mines here, vast areas that were unknown, barely known to science, pretty unknown to policy as well. Just being a scientist present in the process allows it to come to an actionable level where the science can have positive effect. In this case, the 3D imaging produced th this kind of image. This is one of many, many, many. You see the, uh, an area that was mined, and you see from our, one of our spectrometer technologies the amount of suspended sediment in red, which is completely saturated with mercury. The, the hotter the red, the more the mercury. So in this case, this happened just last September, and a, a radical amount, millions of people witnessed this through uh, the scientific 3D imaging. A lot of action came to light. The international community stepped in to Peru, and this is just a series of, uh, of, of news clippings all in six months that lead to policy action based on really solid science. Finally, I want to talk about visualization to promote sustainability. This is a tough one, and it's for the future more than it is for the present. We have some what I would call wicked problems in, uh, in, in the environment that we're facing. My generation, generations long from now will be facing. One is working with, for example, drought. Uh, we've had multiple droughts in the Amazon basin. Here's the, the main stem of the Amazon in the lower right. Here's the footprint of the 2010 drought shown in red. Those are areas that had anom anomalously very low precipitation compared to the long-term mean but it's just one of many droughts that have occurred where the footprint is changing with every occurrence. Here's the outcome in some of the worst zones. This is the lowland Amazon basin. Massive mortality, massive loss. This is what happens if you, when you have a climate, series of climate events that you're not prepared for. How do you work with this as a scientist? How do you deal with this over the next 50 years? Many, many arguments and discussions, many of them in PNAS, uh, a lot of those are focused on the issue of creating ways for species to migrate. And believe it or not, we already know that species are migrating. Not just animals, but believe it or not, trees. We actually have measurements of that through their dispersal and reproduction. We're seeing them move from the lowlands up into the Andes. The critical part of that is making sure they have corridor or places to go when they're actually migrating. So what we've been doing with the technology that I would say is at our doorstep more than um, achieved at this point is learning how to map biodiversity in 3D. 
where all of these colors are different species. You see the orange coming up on the screen, that's a single species. That's why it has the same color. This is, was not possible in 2010. And now we're able to do that. Here's another one, glad that comes out on the screen, where we're now able to fly over and understand the composition of the forest in 3D and the species that live there in the canopy, shown here in different colors. If we can manage to understand that, we can manage to understand what we call the functional diversity of a big region like the Western Amazon. This is my second to last slide, I think. This, this shows Peru looking up into the Andes. You see the Pacific on the top side there, Pacific Ocean. And this was our view year, a year ago. And our new view is based on this kind of biodiversity monitoring and mapping where we're able to make a biodiversity landscape that tells us which communities are more similar than its neighbors, very similar to its neighbors, and which are very different. And from the science, we're able to understand how migrations might occur. And that's just a hypothetical red arrow there as an example. That's the future. The other part of the future is in my last slide is as a scientist, I have thoroughly enjoyed reaching out and getting people to uh, engage this kind of work. I think that visualization is critical, absolutely critical, especially to the new generations that are coming up into the sciences or that don't know they want to be scientists yet. We all say that, but I really have experienced it. I've experienced it at local scales and I've been lucky enough to experience it in very large venues as well. Thank you.